Oh, you know what? It would help if I turn my microphone on. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's my that's my bad. I am having a bad time with technology right now. Okay, so uh, we're talking debate. So you probably have a passing familiarity with debating from political debates where candidates make the case to their election. Uh, it's a performative form of argument where oratory skills are just as important as your argument itself. Uh, debaters are still going to be relying on the three main appeals. Uh, and they're also going to be just as prone to logical fallacies. In fact, many times I feel they're more vulnerable to them because a lot of times they're making up their arguments on the fly. So I feel that by looking at how debates work, uh, some of the elements of debates can be applied to parts of an argu any argument essay. So that's what we're going to do today is look at the basics of how formal debate is supposed to work. Not the, not the way that it actually works in practice, because a lot of times it goes way beyond the pale of the rules are, that are supposed to be followed. Uh, but we'll look at how it's supposed to work. Forgive me, I have a very loudmouth cat behind me. Okay, uh, so debating has a particular structure for how topics are chosen and arguments are cited. So basic debate structure goes like this. First, you have a topic that's chosen. Okay. Typically, this topic is going to be called the resolution or the motion. In the case of classical art and most other written forms, this would be the premise. Okay, That's your equivalent to the resolution or the motion. Now, teams argue affirmative and negative. So you're bas basically doing a yay or nay as far as what you're going to be, what you're going to be arguing, what the sides are. Okay. Now, in competitive debate, this is usually determined by a coin flip. There's no guarantee you'll agree with the side you wind up on, but you'll still have to argue on its behalf. Okay. Now, you have a little bit of leeway with written argument because you do have some control over what side of the argument you take, uh, especially because it's usually re reliant upon your own opinion. Uh, but uh, if you were in a uh, competitive debate setting, that's usually how they determine the, which side each team is on. <clears throat> Now, teams get an hour to prepare and speak for set time limits per member. Typically, it runs in three rounds because most debate teams uh, in competition are three members. <clears throat> okay. Uh, speakers alternate between sides, but the affirmative side always goes first. So if you look at it in a holistic point of view, the argument itself becomes kind of overall an argument for, but then you have the rebuttals coming up as it goes along. Okay. The arguments toward is the debate judge, okay? And the judge is not supposed to be taking a side at all. The judge is strictly supposed to be uh, judging the teams based on how well they can present their arguments and how persuasive they can be, okay? Well, the judge is not supposed to solely judge the quality of the arguments, though. Uh, there is the chance that inherent bias can play a role here. So uh, you want you want to make Make sure you know a little bit about the judge when going into a competition. Okay. Now we're talking about the speaker roles uh, in, in a debate. Because teams are usually made up of three speakers for each side, uh, but there's a particular role and order for each member of the team. Okay. And the reason why this is good is because it kind of mirrors the structure that you need to follow for a classical argument. Okay. So your first affirmative speaker uh, contextualizes the debate, uh, sets out the team's interpretation of what the debate is. It defines terminology if they, they need to. They outline the argument and the team split. So basically outlining who, what their argument is and who, uh, what points each of the members is going to deliver. Okay, uh, And that provides two to three arguments supporting the motion. Okay, uh, Then passes to the first negative. First negative recontextualizes the debate as a rebuttal to the affirmative, including differing definitions. Okay, uh, so if there's a uh, dispute over what the definition of the terminology is, uh, they they will be brought up at this point. Okay, it outlines the argument and the team split for the negative side. Okay, it will attempt to rebut the argument made by the first affirmative, and then provide two to three arguments of their own that oppose the motion. Okay. Now, the seconds for each team are going to rebut the previous and clarify definitional issues, and they're also going to deliver two to three more arguments. Okay. 
Uh, so as it goes here, every speaker is going to rebut the speaker before them, except for the first affirmative. Okay, and every speaker is going to have a rebuttal to their argument, except the third negative. Okay, so thirds for each team specifically rebut the seconds, specifically respond to attacks from the opposition, and conclude with a brief summary of their team's argument and reasoning. Okay, uh, in the lecture video, I mentioned that the thirds are keeping a gripe list. Uh, they're basically pointing pointing out every single uh, misstep and miscalculation that the opposing team makes, okay, as much as they can from the uh, seconds, okay? The third negative has an advantage here because they can also attack the third affirmative, okay? Uh, so there's advantages to going first and last, okay? Uh, when we apply this to written arguments, uh, each of the members of the debate team is producing their own short argument of essay and presenting it orally, but if we look at the debate holistically and compare it to a written argument, the firsts are the background for the argument and its bigger picture meaning. Okay? Though there's a bit of dispute that takes place between them, it also emphasizes the differences between the sides. That's exactly what you have to do in the opening paragraphs and the introduction of your classical arguments. You need to be setting up the background, uh, the origins of the dispute. Why is this something that you need to be debating? The seconds are presenting organized arguments to support the team's main premise, using logical reasoning and evidence to support the premise. Okay. They're also rebutting the opposition using logical reasoning and evidence. Okay. So mainly you're going to be as the seconds are going to be in the position of establishing the argument. Uh, they're going to be presenting the reasons. They're going to be presenting the evidence that supports those reasons. <clears throat> the thirds are offering the fullest rebuttal possible to the opposition while also concluding their team's argument with a brief summary and overview. It would also be their job to offer the parting shot the conclusions call for to convince the audience to keep the argument in mind. Okay, uh, the thirds are basically focusing on rebuttal. They're focusing on uh, this is what my opposition feels. This is the reason that they presented for it. Here's why they're wrong. Okay. All right. Uh, basic debate argument structure here. The very basic structure that debaters use for their arguments is also highly helpful for writers. Okay, uh, They have three elements that they have to uh, consider when they're thinking about their argument structure. First is the claim. Present the argument in a clear manner with a clear statement. Okay. Second is the evidence. The facts supporting the claim, including statistics, references, quotes, and so on. Third is the impact what significance each piece of evidence has for the claim. Okay, so uh, if you put this into writing terms, it's equivalent to reasons for supporting a side of an argument. So the structure can be used for each part of an argument essay and offer a logical backing for the ideas presented. Presenting your reason for supporting the argument and then the evidence that supports that reason. Uh, and optionally, you talk about what the impact of that evidence has uh, what the impact is for each piece of evidence to the claim that it's supporting, okay? Why does it make that claim right? Uh, when we talk about rebuttal, in a debate setting, rebuttal is typically limited to pointing out the logical shortcomings of the opposition and how claims may not hold up to tighter scrutiny. Now, the more typical fallacies present in competitive debates are similar to ones that appear in written arguments as well, okay? Uh, <clears throat> we do have a... Uh, not quite com comprehensive list of fallacies that are typically looked for in an oral debate. Uh, they also all apply to written debate. Okay, they all apply to written argument as well. Uh, starting with false dichotomy, this is the either or fallacy. Splitting the debate into a two-sided issue when there are multitudes of other options. That's the with us or against us fallacy. Okay, uh, you. Really, even though you're being split into two teams in a debate setting, you cannot uh, make everything a black and white decision. Okay? Uh, same goes for writers. Uh, assertions, statements that are not backed up by evidence, typically assumptions. Okay? Uh, this is getting into uh, inherent biases. Okay? Well, about the topic, uh, whether they are backed up by evidence or not, you believe this, so dang it, it has to be true. 
Okay, uh, those kinds of assertions don't really have a good place in logical arguments. Uh, then you have the morally flawed fallacy: statements and arguments that are questionable in their distribution of fairness and/or morality. Okay, uh, you don't really see this a lot. Uh, in written arguments, unless they're trying to argue against something that is utterly horrifyingly deplorable, okay? Uh, unfortunately, in the day's day and age, that's starting to become more and more prevalent, okay? But typically, the, this fallacy is used to attack an argument that is shown to be questionable in fairness. Uh, fair to your side, it's not being fair to their own side. Uh, it's not being uh, moral in terms of being tolerant, of being fair, of being non-discriminatory, anything like that. Anything that makes people feel, I guess the quick term would be, if it makes you feel icky about having to uh, deal with that argument, then it's morally flawed. Okay? Uh, we have correlation versus causation. Okay? Uh, just because one thing happens... Uh, one thing happens when another thing happens does not necessarily mean that uh, just because A happens and B happens doesn't mean that A is B, okay? Uh, just because it rains every time Mary comes to a picnic doesn't mean we don't invite Mary to the picnic, okay? Uh, there's co Correlation does not always equal causation, okay? Unless you can logically prove that, yes, A led to B, you can't assert that A happened and B happened, therefore A must mean B. Okay, you can't make that assertion unless you have solid evidence to prove it. This occurs when you don't have that evidence. Uh, failure to deliver promises. The speaker has promised evidence that they have not produced. Okay, again, something that you would rarely see in a written argument, but I thought it was included nonetheless because it's actually an interesting uh, plan of attack against the opponent. It's like you said. Okay, your opponent said that uh, if this happened, then uh, everything would be butterflies and happiness, and everything turned into uh, smog and raw sewage. Okay, uh, they failed to deliver their promises. Okay, uh, you have the straw man. We talked about this before. Create a false, saturated version of the opposition that's easier to attack, and therefore makes your side look more reasonable in comparison. Okay. Uh, we have a contradiction fallacy, which presenting two conflicting arguments that cancel each other out, thus reducing the side's credibility. Okay, this is primarily, uh, as it states, is an attack on your opponent's credibility because based solely on the fact that they have presented these two arguments uh, that are contradictory to each other and do not match up. Okay, they do not complement each other; they actually cancel each other out. Okay. Uh, finally, compare the conclusion to reality. The conclusion presented is oversimplified and may have further complications if put into effect. Okay, uh, so let's use this in uh, fairly simple terms in pop culture terms that I uh, recognize or I can remember at least off the top of my head. Uh, there is a uh, uh, episode of Simpsons about maybe eight, nine, ten years ago that aired uh, where uh, Homer Simpson became the uh, sanitation director of Springfield, uh, and he kind of oversimplified his uh, stance where to try to impress the sanitation workers. Uh, he had like shiny new shiny new garbage trucks and pristine white uniforms, and uh, he uh, spent a lot of money to upgrade everything for the sanitation department. Except he basically blew the entire budget on that, and it lasted all of two days before the department was out of money. They couldn't run the trucks. They, they couldn't pay the sanitation workers, so the sanitation workers went on strike. Garbage started piling up, and then eventually he had to uh, resign the position, and it went back to the guy who he had won the position from in the election in the first place. Okay, uh, so his conclusion that he could uh, make a garbage paradise basically for Springfield uh, oversimplified the fact that it takes a lot more than just pretty trucks and uh, handsome uniforms uh, to run a garbage collection and operation. All right, so uh, talk about important skills for debating, and I picked the ones out that would. Apply to writing, okay? 
for a debater to be successful, there's some elements that need to be present in their argument. Okay, the ones that I picked out here are the ones that, again, most applicable to written arguments. So first off, make points relevant to the top to the topic. Okay, uh, don't be going off on any kind of tangents. Don't don't be trying to introduce evidence that makes no difference to the subject matter at all. Okay, do not try to lawyer this. Okay. Uh, provide evidence when you can, not just your own personal opinion. Okay, we need to have arguments that are based in facts, not just based in feelings. That's where I, that's why we're in so much trouble right now as it is. Okay. Uh, remain objective when arguing. Passionate arguments can become illogical, so control your emotions. Okay, this can be very difficult, and I know it kind of goes against what I've said in the past, where I felt that if you felt strongly about an argument, you'll actually write better about it. The problem is also, uh, on the flip side of that, if you feel passionately about an object, you will also argue a little bit too emotionally about it, and your logic may suffer. Okay, so just to prevent that, try to keep your emotions out of the argument. Stick strictly with the facts. Stick strictly with the logical progression. Okay. Uh, consider the audience's attention span. Okay. Uh, I believe I used uh, Hamilton as the example uh, in the lecture for this, uh, but think about how long your audience is willing to sit there and listen to or read your argument. Uh, so do not keep going droning on and on and on and on and on. Okay, uh, you have to read the room. Okay. Uh, next one: employ comparative thinking. How would things be different if the opposition wins or status quo remains versus if you win? Okay. Oh wait, I skipped one here. Uh, pathos, ethos, and logos. Use those to support your rhetoric. Okay. Absolutely, at all times, use the element, basic elements of logical rhetoric to support your uh, claims, to support your argument entirely. Okay. Uh, again, employ comparative thinking. How would things be if the opposition wins or the status quo remains versus if you win? How can you how can you show that life is going to be better? Okay, how are things going to change? Okay, or conversely, how are things going to be worse if your opposition has their way? Okay, again, you have to be careful here because it can sometimes lead to that slippery slope fallacy. However, syllogism works in this in this case. Uh, any kind of logical progression that's backed up by evidence, where you can show side prevailing is the preferable outcome is going to help you, okay? Uh, keep your language simple, okay? Uh, that's a big thing that people don't seem to uh, tend to underestimate is that simplicity of language is going to help you in the long run. It's got, it doesn't really do you much good to be the smartest person in the room and talk like the smartest person in the room if the smartest per if the second smartest person in the room only has a uh, only has an IQ under 50. Okay, so uh, do not try to overcomplicate your language, make it too flowery, flowery, make it too uh, fancy, schmancy, or anything like that. Keep it simple. Uh, avoid hyperbole. Don't use terms like always or never. Okay, avoid making things like the best, the worst. Okay, uh, so bad, so good. All right. Uh, we all, we all, we all can name one person who uses this a lot. Okay, don't do what he does. All right. Um, avoid fallacious argument techniques. Okay, uh, this includes things like falsifying data or evidence. Okay, many people have gotten into trouble. Uh, over the fact that they have falsified data or they have misread data or misinterpreted it, okay? Especially if they falsified it, okay? A uh, good example of this is Andrew Wakefield, who was the doctor uh, who famously produced a uh, uh, academic paper which claimed that uh, vac the MMR vaccine cause, uh, was a direct cause of autism. Uh, and was kind of is kind of the uh, ground zero of the anti-vax movement. Okay, uh, here's the problem though. He falsified his evidence for that paper, uh, and he also did not disclose that he uh, was receiving money to do the study from a pharmaceutical company who was in competition uh, with 
the pharmaceutical company, company that did most of the MMR uh, uh, vaccines in Europe. Uh, and the company that uh, found that paid for his study was trying to establish their own MMR vaccine. Okay. So uh, he had too small of a sample size. He only looked at 12 patients and the uh, results were not going the way he wanted them to. He actually fabricated uh, evidence to show his uh, opinion being correct. Uh, but as a result of this, uh, he was actually disgraced over this, even though uh, in anti-vaxxer circles, he continues to be a prominent speaker and a prominent voice uh, because everybody seems to think uh, there's conspiracies over everything. Uh, but as far as what eventually the fallout was of the affair was that uh, the paper was retracted by the journal that published it, which was a prominent medical journal called The Lancet. Uh, and Wakefield himself, because of the uh, problems that he uh, did with uh, fabricating his evidence, uh, he actually lost his medical license over it. Okay, So uh, do not falsify data because the consequences are going to be brutal. Okay. Another one, attacking the arguer for the opposition rather than the opposing argument. Okay. Uh, this would be the ad hominem fallacy, which you've seen a lot in politics. Okay. There is so much of a temptation to just wail on the op wail on the opposing uh, arguer without engaging in their with their argument. Okay. Uh, then disagreeing with facts or obvious truths. This is the alternative facts fallacy that's become so prominent lately. Okay, uh, we are not dealing with facts that can be altered based on the fact that they hurt your feelings. Okay, uh, disagreeing with facts is not going to get anybody anywhere. So do not do it when you do your own arguments. And that gets us to the last slide. Uh, and that is the examples of debating. Now, I've asked uh, in the lecture to view these examples and to post your observations to the questions of the professor forum. Uh, it is now Thursday, and as far as I can tell, no one has done this. Okay, uh, very few have done it in the other one, but absolutely nobody has done it in this section because the uh, only post in that thread uh, is mine starting it, okay? So, uh, as a result, I need to I need you guys to be participating in these practice exercises because ultimately they are there to help you. They are there to help you understand what you need to know to accomplish these tasks and to learn how to argue effectively and learn how to persuade people effectively, okay? Uh, how to use your evidence, how to uh, logically progress from one point to the next, okay? Uh, I need you to try to understand that we, these, are, these exercises are not there just to give you busy work. These exercises are there to help you, okay? So uh, just as a summary here, we have uh, three videos that give you uh, snippets from several debates. Uh, 1960 presidential debate, uh, JFK versus Richard Nixon. Uh, the debate that was uh, both broadcast on television and on radio, which led to audiences have, believing there were two different winners, depending on which media they uh, took in the debate on. Uh, because television viewers felt Kennedy won, but radio listeners felt that Nixon won. Okay. Uh, the second was the debate highlights. Okay. Uh, debate the debates there highlighted. Uh, for uh, 1984, Reagan versus Mondale, that's a uh, zinger that Reagan got in on Mondale, uh, talking about uh, not making age an issue in the campaign, and he won't make his opponent's uh, youth and experience against him, uh, keeping in mind that uh, at the time that Reagan made this, made this crack, he was pushing 70, and Mondale was, uh, I believe, 64 uh, during that election, okay? Uh, 76 Ford versus Carter. Uh, it's a uh, uh, very famous, uh, very famous uh, bad answer that uh, Ford, who was the sitting president, gave during that uh, debate, asking when the moderator asked about the Soviet bloc uh, and what countries were included in the Soviet bloc. Uh, Ford seemed to be blissfully ignorant of the fact that uh, Yugoslavia, Poland, and Hungary were all considered to be part of the Soviet bloc because. The 
It's had huge influences on their governments. Uh, let's see, 1988 Reg Benson versus Quail, uh, best known for a... Uh, Jack was a friend you connection because of course it does. Uh, why, 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 why? There we go. Okay. All right, so we're back. So uh, Benson Quayle is in there. Uh, 1988 Bush Senior versus Dukakis. Uh, this was the first. This one is the first question of that uh, debate. Uh, where the moderator asks uh, uh, Michael Dukakis flat out uh, if uh, his wife was raped and murdered, if he would support a uh, death penalty. Uh, Dukakis re responds with no. Uh, this one is actually considered to be one of the uh, more famous cheap shots in American politics. Uh, and weirdly enough, it's a cheap shot that came from the moderator rather than coming from one, of, one candidate to the other. Uh, next one, 1992, Gore versus Quayle versus Stockdale. The part of this uh, debate, which is three ways, because the uh, uh, Stockdale was the running mate for H. Ross Perot, who was running as a uh, Reform Party independent candidate. Uh, the part of this debate that they give is uh, Stockdale's opening statements, where he just starts trailing off. It looks like he starts having a war flashback in the middle of his statement, but he puts his glasses on and refocuses. Okay, uh, because he starts trailing off after he mentions uh, dealing with torture in Vietnam. Uh, out of, and it's completely out of nowhere. Okay. Uh, then 2008, Biden versus Palin. Uh, this is vice presidential debate to, for 2008. Uh, this clip is mainly known for... Uh, this clip is ba basically mainly known for uh, Biden giving a cohesive response about uh, knowing what the middle class live like because he's lived among, he used to be middle class, he is still considered, considers himself middle class, uh, and he keeps going back to his old neighborhood, and his opponent is uh, Alaska Governor Sarah Palin, who gives a response that uh, addresses absolutely none of what the initial question could have possibly been uh, and in fact spends more time giving shout outs to a third grade uh, elementary school class than she does actually answering the question. Okay. Uh, the, the last one here, 2009 British House of Commons. Uh, put this in as a bit of variety uh, because they do their dates uh, very differently across the pond. Uh, it says here that the uh, that David Cameron is the Speaker of the House of Commons. I misspoke there. He is uh, he's actually the opposition party leader. Uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons is actually supposed to be an impartial judge in Britain who basically tries to keep the debate civil. Uh, you'll actually they both both men actually will address the speaker. Okay, uh, because they have to send put their arguments through him, even though they're trying to confront each other. Okay, uh, and there's a lot of uh, at least one student in one of the other in one of the other sections has noted a lot of acrimony between Cameron and and Brown. Uh, there's a lot of name calling. There's a lot of uh, teasing. Uh, there's a lot of brutal teasing, uh, but there's also a lot of talk about policy. Uh, in the middle of all that. In fact, I mentioned in the video that one of the commenters on that video says it's more like a rap battle than a political debate. Okay, so uh, that does it for these slides. Uh, uh, let's get let's go ahead and open up to questions. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and raise your hand, uh, and uh, we will uh, address those as we do. Uh, we'll take about 10 minutes for that, and then we'll take a look at uh, eCampus. Uh, for what you need to be doing with the uh, essays. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, Rita, I see your hand there. Go ahead with your question. Next assignment, do the essay. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, that essay is due tomorrow. That essay should, should be getting workshopped uh, as we speak here. We need to – I'm going to go over uh, what you need to do with that essay uh, once we're done with this uh, question and answer session real quick. Okay. All right. Okay, for grammar editing portion of the original workshop, oh, let's flash out. Do you want us to use track changes in Word? No. Uh, I I'm going to show I'm going to talk about how to do this, but basically what I want I don't want you using the track changes function. I actually want you to be entirely new drafts. Okay, uh, so that way I can see the progress. All right, and I don't want to use the word function because I'll be quite frank, I don't trust word functions a lot, uh, things like their grammar checker and especially their spell checker. Uh, and I have, uh, I, I'm a bit of a Luddite in that regard where I'm suspicious of technology. Uh, so I would rather just see the whole essay evolve. Okay. <clears throat> How should we show them their edits? Uh, you you can uh, copy paste uh, passages to the discussion board and uh, show them what show them what you feel needs fixing. Uh, that would be my that would be my best suggestion. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's this question here? <clears throat> okay. When when you've used track changes in Word, okay, uh, I do I do understand that, uh, but I the, also I'm using those uh, I'm also using those boards as a way of tracking uh, for progress reports. So if you're using the track changes function in Word, I can't see what you guys are doing.
All right, folks. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk over what you need to do with these drafts. Uh, first off, again, if you haven't done so already, uh, most of you, I think, already have. Uh, at least one of you has already, turned, already submitted a uh, proofreading draft to the board. Okay. Uh, you, these papers need to have been workshopped twice. Uh, once last week for the revision workshop, and then once this week for proofreading and editing. Okay. Uh, so on the uh, team discussion, team one going right here. Uh, this is what I want you guys to do. Okay. Once it loads here. All right. Uh, post your uh, argument as a file attachment to a reply to the thread. And then when you give your feedback, uh, give your feedback as replies to that file. Okay. Uh, reply directly to the the uh, reply that's been made by your teammate. Okay. Uh, this team has done it very well. Okay. Uh, so everybody needs to have run their paper through their team twice. So first time is just for revisions. Second time is for uh, proofreading and editing. Uh, I'm still receiving emails from folks who are saying that their teams are not giving them feedback. Uh, and I'm also still receiving uh, emails from people who don't even are unclear of what to do. Uh, I am trying to make it as clear as possible here. Okay. So, again, you are uh, posting your drafts to this board. Okay. And your teammates are workshopping them. Now, when you go to turn it in, uh, when you're when you've completely done both drafts. Uh, both the revision and the pr and proofreading. Uh, you're going to go to the major essays and assignments tab here. Okay, and then we're going to go under argument one. Uh, argument one. Here is the link down at the very bottom. Okay, at the the, uh, the bottom of the page. Uh, it's in purple so that it catches your eye. Uh, so classical argument essay. Take a look at this requirement here. Make sure of the following before you attach your file. First off, make sure that your file is in one of the four acceptable file formats. It's .doc, .docx, .pdf, or .rtf. Uh, for Google Docs users, please make sure your file is saved in one of the acceptable four formats before attaching it. Also, make sure that the file is saved to your computer before attaching it, because we've, as we've discovered this last couple of weeks, uh, Blackboard has trouble with links to cloud computing. Okay, so uh, make sure that you have a physical file on your computer that you are attaching to uh, your response to this assignment. Okay. Second is the format for the file. The file should contain the following drafts in the following order. Okay, so basically starting from the top of the paper, the very first page, going as you scroll down. Okay. First thing you should see is the final draft with the works cited page. Okay, works cited should only go with the for, with the final draft. Uh, then after the works cited page, the next thing will be the proofreading draft. So that's the draft that you've submitted this week to your discussion boards. Okay, following that draft is the revision draft. That is the one that you submitted last week to the discussion boards. Okay. So I want to be able to see all three drafts so that I can see the progress of your writing. Okay. Uh, and then third, your essay should have been fully workshopped twice before turning it in. Now, granted, I know folks don't have a lot of control over that, uh, but as much as possible, we'll try. To, we want you guys to workshop them as much as you can. That's why this link did not open up until today. Okay. So uh, just to make sure we're percent clear. Uh, repeating those instructions. First, uh, make sure the file format is acceptable, then that you have a physical copy of the file on your computer. Okay. Uh, file should have uh, the final draft first with the works cited page, then the proofreading draft, then the revision draft, and then the, the essay should have been fully workshopped twice before turning it in. Okay. So uh, that covers that pretty much. Oh, one other thing. Uh, as I mentioned on the announcements earlier in the week, uh, the uh, th this week I have to put in progress reports. 
so your progress report, whether it's I, when I do progress reports, is usually either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Uh, your progress report is going to be dependent on your participation with the boards, uh, which means that you have to have left you have to have uh, left a draft on the discussion board, and you have to have uh, produced at least one piece of feedback. Uh, that's the bare minimum you have to have to receive a satisfactory. Okay, I prefer you'd be doing a lot more than that, but if you have if your time is restricted, and that's the best you can do, I'm okay with that. But they said you needed to do that by today. Okay, so uh, I don't think any of you have that problem. I think all three of you have uh, done have met this requirement. Uh, but for the others who are going to be watching this on the video, uh, that is the requirement for a uh, satisfactory progress report. Okay, uh, so we'll open it up for five more minutes worth of questions, uh, and then we'll go, let then we'll cut you guys loose. So any any further questions that anybody has, go ahead and raise your hand, uh, and uh, I'll recognize you. Okay, Ashley, I see your hand there. What's your question? Mind tap assignments, the one mark practice are not required. Uh, that is correct. The ones that are marked practice are the ones that are not going to count toward your grade. Okay. That is to say that you can still do them. They're just not going to receive a grade for them. The ones that are marked uh, uh, grade, graded assignments, or I forget how Mind tap designates them, but it's usually with an orange dot. Uh, those ones are the ones that are going to be counting for your grade. So that's fine. Yeah, here's here's the thing. Uh, MindTap is set up for multiple multiple instructors to use, and some instructors prefer to have uh, their students turn in the major essays through it. Okay, uh, I do not do that mainly because I'm already dealing with one learning system. I don't want to have to try to filter through another one to get progress. Okay, I'd rather have one grade book that I can deal with. Okay. Okay, Vanek, I see your hand there. What's your question? Issues with citations. Okay, what what exact issues are you having? Uh, you, if you want, go ahead and use your microphone if you have one. Might be easier for you to to say it. <clears throat> Yes. 
Uh, yeah, Rena has it right there. Uh, the Purdue Owl uh, website will help you with that. Okay. I'm throwing up the throwing up the URL for it on uh, your chat, and I'm going to throw it up on the I'm going to throw the URL up on the uh, uh, screen here for the folks who are not with us and watch this on the video. Let's make it as big as we can. There we go. All right. Okay, we got about one minute left here. Any last minute questions? Uh, go ahead and hit me. All right, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up then. Uh, thank you for coming to this week's uh, session. Uh, we will have another one next week, same time, uh, same place. Uh, I will see you guys then. Thank you very much.